Professor Jeffrey Rosenfeld, AC, OBE, has a deep understanding of the Holocaust, having experienced the aftermath of genocide in Rwanda, in which almost a million innocent people were murdered. He served as a military surgeon with the United Nations Assistance Mission in Rwanda in 1996. Jeffrey is a professor of surgery at Monash University and senior neurosurgeon at the Alfred Hospital. He is also a major general in the Australian Defence Force and a former Surgeon General. Jeffrey has served on eight deployments, including Iraq, East Timor, Bougainville and the Solomon Islands. He is the Patron-in-Chief of the Victorian Association of Jewish Ex and Serving Men and Women, VAJEX, and we are very honoured to welcome the eminent Professor Rosenfeld to the podium to deliver his address. Thank you, Sue. To Eva Slonim and all the survivors that are here and their families, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. As you've heard, on January the 27th, 1945, 75 years ago, the Russian soldiers entered Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp and liberated over 7,000 desperate, emaciated prisoners who had miraculously survived the Nazi terror. The Nazis had already forced the majority of Auschwitz prisoners to march westward in death marches. The construction of four large gas chambers and crematoria began in Birkenau in 1942. They went into operation between March and June of 1943. The Nazis set up thousands of concentration camps from my reading. The Nazis distinguished slave labor and prison camps from extermination and death camps. They made the distinction themselves. The death camps primary function was genocide. Auschwitz-Birkenau was a death camp which had the largest death count of all of the camps with the deaths of over 1.1 million people. There have been massacres of people throughout history, but the murder of six million Jews was a deliberate planned elimination of an entire group of people based on their religion, culture and race, namely the Jews of Europe, where most Jews lived at that time. The industrial scale of this murder of innocent people was totally unprecedented in history. Other Nazi undesirables were murdered in the death camps as well. We shouldn't forget them, including gays, homosexuals, Soviet prisoners of war, political prisoners, and the Roma gypsies. The media describes concentration camps where the Chinese Uyghurs are, forced, are in forced detention. These are so-called re-education facilities by the Chinese. They have no equivalence whatsoever to the Nazi concentration camps where Jews were enslaved for the Nazi war machine and many more were murdered by gassing and then incinerating them. Let's put things into perspective. Well, why have I been given the honor of speaking to you? Unlike Eva Slonim, my father and his immediate family and my wife's family managed to avoid the Holocaust and get out of Poland before it, it, the, the worst happened. And they were able to eventually to migrate to Australia. But I am the, an eyewitness to the genocide and hatred that occurred in Rwanda in 1995, as you heard. <clears throat> I was deployed to Rwanda just after the genocide in which upwards of a million innocent people were massacred and murdered. Murder and retribution was occurring whilst I was there. I was a military surgeon and member of the Australian contingent of the UN peacekeeping force, Unimir II, which eventually brought peace to that troubled nation. I treated many Rwandans, including men and women and children, with deliberately inflicted machete injuries in an, in an attempt to murder them, and many others with landmine injuries. I have also deployed since to Iraq twice and witnessed the murderous acts of Al-Qaeda and ISIS fanatics. Why hasn't humankind learnt the lessons of the Holocaust? How could the genocides of Rwanda, Cambodia, Darfur and Bosnia 
have occurred after the horrors of Auschwitz and the Holocaust. I would like to consider the underpinnings of genocide and how we should prevent genocide from happening again. Racial differentiation and identification, envy, discrimination and irrational hatred is at the core. In Rwanda, the Hutus hated the Tutsis and rose up against them. This hatred had been going on for centuries, just as anti-Semitism had been going on for centuries in Europe. Anti-Semitism, the irrational hatred of Jews, was the fundamental basis for the Holocaust. The genocide was highly organised. The Jews were loyal citizens and were well integrated into German and European society. But they made, that made no difference to the Nazis and their collaborators. The Nazis knew where all the Jews lived. The Jews were often given up to the Nazis by their neighbours and workmates, Christians. The Nazis kept detailed records concerning the Jews, who they were, where they lived, and who was, who was sent to the concentration camps. The Hutu Rwandans who, perpet who perpetrated the genocide against the Tutsis had lists of where all the Tutsis lived. You can see the commonalities. Dehumanisation of the victim is also a powerful precursor to genocide. The Nazis portrayed the Jews as rats and vermin to be exterminated. The Rwandans portrayed their victims as cockroaches to be stamped out. There is also irrational blame placed on the victims for deteriorating living standards and financial problems. Hitler and the Nazis scapegoated the Jews as the cause of all of Germany's economic woes at the time. In Rwanda, the Tutsis were the upper class overlords and the Hutus were the workers who rose up against their masters, somewhat different to Nazi Germany. Radio broadcasts were the trigger for the genocide in Rwanda. The Holocaust spread over a much longer period. Now in the words of Primo Levi, monsters exist, but they are too few in number to be truly dangerous. More dangerous are the common men, the functionaries ready to believe and to act without asking questions. The human brain, which I know a fair bit about, has the built-in controls to avoid inflicting pain on others. The Nazi SS monsters were psychopaths who did not have these controls. They had no empathy and derived pleasure from hurting and witnessing the suffering of others. Hannah Arendt, that well-known author, characterised the Nazi functionary as the banality of evil. The banality of evil. In many cases, they were ordinary citizens doing the bidding of Himmler and Hitler, but not always. Adolf Eichmann was an ordinary functionary who helped to organise the genocide, but he was also a psychopath who hated the Jews with a passion. Reinhard Heydrich, Himmler's deputy, chaired the infamous January 1942 Von C conference on the final solution of the Jewish question. Of the 15 Nazis who attended, including Eichmann, amazingly eight held academic doctorates. It only lasted 90 minutes, that planning session for the, for the Holocaust, the genocide. They spoke about the logistics of genocide and according to Eichmann, they also spoke about methods of killing and extermination. Normal SS business. How could Heydrich, a man who appreciated high art and culture and played Mozart and Beethoven on his violin, become such a vile monster overseeing the organisation and execution of the genocide? Because he was a power-hungry psychopath who harboured an intense hatred of Jews. As a doctor, I must also mention the SS doctors and Eva will know a lot about them, and Dr Mengele. I shouldn't even call him a doctor. After World War II, the world learned the horrors of German doctors such as Joseph Mengele working in Auschwitz and other concentration camps. They helped select the Jews for execution 
and they conducted horrific and deadly scientific experiments in which the subjects, particularly children and twins, had no say whatsoever. The Nuremberg Code was introduced in August 1947 after the Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals and this signalled the beginning of modern medical ethics. In these trials, Nazi doctors were convicted of the crimes committed during human experiments on concentration camp prisoners. The Nuremberg Code attempted to give clear rules about what was legal when conducting human experiments, and we follow them today. I would now like to address the very important issue of anti-Semitism. It is deeply concerning to me, and I'm sure all of you, that anti-Semitic incidents are increasing internationally and in Australia as well. The worst incidents are perpetrated by the white supremacist neo-Nazis and the Islamic extremists inspired by Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Jews are attacked verbally, physically in the streets, in the synagogues and in their homes. Nazi graffiti are increasingly appearing. Jewish graves are desecrated. A Nazi flag was recently flown with pride in a front garden in country Victoria. In my view, the public display of Nazi symbolism should be banned and illegal. A young Jewish boy was recently bullied and forced to prostrate himself before a Muslim boy and kiss the boy's feet. These horrific incidents are totally unacceptable. The perpetrators must be identified and brought to account or to justice. More insidious are the attempts to portray Hitler as a comedic, pathetic figure of ridicule, such as the German novel I'm Back and the recent film based on the novel Caging Skies. To me, this is an unacceptable recasting of history. Hitler's character should not be reimagined, recast or placed in a more positive light. He will forever remain an evil monster. Fortunately, we live in Australia where Australians are intolerant of racists and bigots. The more anti-Semitism there is, the stronger is the resolve of the Jewish people to defend themselves and the stronger burns the flame of the Jewish faith. Never again is what we say every year, but how can we prevent a future Auschwitz? Indeed, how can we prevent anti-Semitism and racial hatred, which are precursors to genocide? And I'll give you four answers to that question. First, by remembering the unprecedented, despicable and depraved crimes perpetrated by Hitler, the SS and the Nazis. Indeed, by remembering the Holocaust and the six million Jews who were murdered by the Nazis. Second, by educating young people around the world, including Australia, about the Holocaust. And I congratulate the Holocaust Centre for doing just that. In 2017, believe it or not, 40% of 14-year-olds in Germany did not know what Auschwitz was. A 2018 survey found that 66% of American millennials and 41% of all US adults did not know what Auschwitz was. I wonder what the figures would be here in Australia, probably fairly similar. Just as children are taught the three R's, they should also be taught good citizenship. And I agree with Tanya Plibersek, who said that today, today uh, as well, or yesterday. And about the need for tolerance and respect for all races, religions, and creeds. Living in a multicultural society, such as ours, helps to inculcate a good community spirit in most children. Children also need to be taught what anti-Semitism actually means. As they get older, they also need to be taught what happens when civility breaks down and discrimination, envy and hatred become the guiding forces. This progresses to vandalism, then to physical violence, murder and on a mass scale, genocide with the Holocaust as the centrepiece. Third, by always calling out anti-Semitism and racial hatred when it occurs. But it is ordinary citizens standing up against tyrants 
and calling out racism and bigotry when they see it, who are the key to preventing genocide in the future, the ordinary citizen. Dr. Devere Abramovich, the chairman of the Anti-Defamation Commission, is a wonderful example of this. I also mention the Aboriginal gentleman, William Cooper, who on behalf of the Australian Aborigines League at the time, planned to meet the German consul in Melbourne to protest the cruel persecution of the Jewish people. On the, he went there on the 6th of December, 1938, and asked that his letter be conveyed to the German government. The delegation was refused entry. Alf Turner, Cooper's grandson, presented the consulate with a replica letter 79 years later, which did eventually reach the German government. It was one of the only protests in the world at the time, and it came from an Aboriginal man here in Melbourne. Fourth and finally, by having a committed police force and a strong legal framework to bring perpetrators to justice so that others are educated and hopefully deterred from repeating the same crimes. Although many key Nazi war criminals were brought to justice, others unfortunately escaped. An international criminal court and the International War Crimes Tribunal were set up so that the war criminals of the future can be tried, prosecuted and punished. Justice and deterrence are strong weapons we have to prevent future genocide. Hitler envisaged the Third Reich to be like a new Roman Empire in which he would rule the entire world. The German military was completely defeated by the Allies, including Australia and New Zealand forces. Hitler and Nazism were destroyed. The Third Reich turned to rubble and the Jewish people survived and now thrive in Israel and the diaspora. May it be so forevermore. Let us remember the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust, those innocents who died in the gas chambers in Auschwitz and other death camps, those who were enslaved, worked and beaten to death, those who were tortured, those who were summarily shot, those subjected to sadistic medical experiments, and those women and their babies who were brutally murdered. Can you imagine a Nazi soldier throwing a baby against a wall to, to kill the child? It happened. On the brighter side, let us also celebrate those who survived, like Eva, eventually married and had large extended families. Many of these families thrived in Australia, as you know. It is of great historical importance that many of them recorded their experiences for, for posterity. I will finish with the words of Primo Levi. Auschwitz is outside of us, but it is all around us. It's in the air. The plague has died away, but the infection still lingers, and it would be foolish to deny it. Rejection of human solidarity, obtuse and cynical indifference to the suffering of others, abdication of the intellect and of moral sense to the principle of authority, and above all, at the root of everything, a sweeping tide of cowardice, a colossal cowardice which masks itself as warring virtue, love of country, and faith in an idea. We cannot allow the genocide to ever happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Geoffrey, for your outstanding keynote address. We have a number of Rwandan survivors here tonight who I'm sure were very moved by your words. I particularly liked your discussion of the human brain. Do you think it can be reprogrammed for kindness and goodness rather than cruelty and evil? Your message is clear. We must learn from these dark chapters of human history and remain vigilant against discrimination whenever and wherever it occurs. And I agree with your points that remembrance, education and calling out racism are vital. And that is the mission statement of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and our Jewish Holocaust Centre. So thank you very much for your keynote address.